You're listening to Hofstra's Morning Wake Up Call on 88.7 FM WRHU. I'm Bradley Clark, and I'm joined in studio now with a man of many professions. He's a former high school principal, an education reporter for WCBS News Radio 880 in New York, an adjunct professor at the Lawrence Herbert School of Communications here at Hofstra, and is the author of a new book called Five Freshmen, A Story of the 60s. This is Dr. Stephen Cusin. Dr. Cusin, thank you so much for joining me on the program. And thank you for having me. Now, before we actually get to talk about the book, I want to explain to our audience how we know each other. I actually took your course here at the School of Communications last fall, and we bonded over our love of game shows. Correct. And this was such a coincidence that I decided to choose your class to take, and now we talk about game shows all the time, and now we're here talking about your new book. Same passion, and now we go on to the book. Look at that. It's a small world. Yes, it is. So Five Freshmen, A Story of the 60s is inspired by your actual time at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York from 1965 to 1969. That was a precarious time to be a adolescent in America. What was the experience like being a college kid at that time? I entered one Cornell University in 1965, and I left a very different Cornell in 1969. I happened to be there during the four, I guess, most turbulent years. Very, very different. And I would attribute it to three things. Obviously, the war in Vietnam. Also, the civil rights movement, and third, women's lib. It was a time of turmoil, change, and as I say, uh, two different universities, one in 1965 and one in 1969. Did you know anyone who got drafted for the war? Oh, yes. It was a scary time, too, because the um, draft was hanging over us. And I make reference to, this is a novel, but I make reference to characters, to people who were snatched out out of the classroom and didn't return. We would be sitting in a lecture hall, and somebody would be missing for a day or two, and you'd matter-of-factly ask, hey, what happened? I'll use you as an example. What happened to Bradley? And then there'd be silence. You don't know. He got a call from his local draft board to report home. He was on his way off to the rice paddies. So who are the five freshmen based on? When I got the idea to write the book, which, interestingly enough, uh, the genesis was your class, one of your classes, the students were fascinated with the 60s and the war in Vietnam. And I, just, I decided I'm going to write a book about this, but not a textbook. That would be boring. I wanted to write a novel. And I started to talk about myself, but I needed more characters. They are four other uh, fictional characters that I created, composites of people I met. One of the things I like to do is create characters, people I meet. Who knows, Bradley, you may be in my next novel. Oh, <laughs> I'm I hope so. working on it already. I kind of hone the descriptions. I try to really develop them. I don't want stereotypes, but I try to develop the four characters as much in depth as I can. So they're fictional. Oh, so they are fictional, yes. but they're based on people that you knew. And not necessarily Cornell. They oh, may wow. be students or people I know. That's how I work things. So I, you're a big people watcher. I'm a big people watcher. Me too. I like to look around and see the different characters that you'll see just walking around on your daily day. It could be a neighbor. It could be a crazy aunt. It could be uh, the letter carrier. It could be anybody who's an interesting person could pop up in one of my uh, novels. Yeah, when I was in high school, when I was a drama major in high school and we had playwriting classes, I'd always base my characters on people I knew. Even if it was just a small trait of someone I knew, they'd go in there. You have to do that. Otherwise, your writing is going to fall into stereotypical descriptions, and you don't want to do that. You want to have real people. And what I said when you took the class... No two people are exactly the same, and that's the advantage that you have. You can find people who are unique and use them. And I'm talking to Dr. Stephen Cusin, author of the book Five Freshmen, Story of the 60s, which is based on his real-life college experiences at Cornell University from the mid to late 60s. Has anyone from your time period at Cornell reached out to you about the book? It's too new. It just came out about a week ago, so I'm waiting for that to happen. Some friends, by word of mouth, heard about it. Facebook is much more powerful. Social media, much more powerful than I ever expected it to be. I've gotten an early response from people who have read it already, and they said they've relived their, their college years through the book. I'm glad to hear that. Speaking of the media, you are a media adjunct professor here. Yes. What was the media scene like back in 1965? Very different, because now you have so many different outlets. You've got 500 cable channels. You've got so many options. Back then, it was basically the big three networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and yes, some independent stations. But it was much more limited than it is today. With the turmoil of the war and the civil rights and all that stuff, was entertainment like movies, music, television, was that an escape for a lot of the the college kids? Yeah, it was a diversion. But uh, as the war crept closer and closer, diversions were put aside and student activism became primary extra 
extracurricular activity. First, tables were set up in the student union. Imagine they would be set up here in the student union building for some causes. But as the war heated up, more and more people jumped on the anti-war bandwagon then. And for good reason, because they felt the desti their destinies were not in their control. Who knows, uh, would they finish their college years? And it was just, that was a frightening thing. Perhaps the most frightening thing was the draft lottery. I'll never forget that night in which numbers were literally drawn out of a hat, birthday order, to determine who was going to go and who was going to stay. That was probably one of the most scariest experiences I ever had. And I know another scary experience you had involved your father yes. at a building hostage. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I had a front row seat to what took place. Up until April 1969, there had been many campus demonstrations, Berkeley, Columbia, other schools. Cornell was unique, sadly so. It was the first time that weapons were used in a building takeover, the Student Union Building. Fortunately, they weren't used. I think it was Kent State where they were used, if I'm not mistaken. But it's almost comical looking back, but it really wasn't back then. My father was visiting for parents' weekend, and uh, the procrastinator that I am, I had failed to get him a hotel room. So... I was able to get a room in the Student Union Building. Believe it or not, they had a few Spartan rooms, bed, desk, and lamp in the Student Union Building. So on April 18th, he arrived, and I took him to this room. It was more like a cell, and I went back to Cayuga Heights, where I was living, in, in my apartment. Five o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call, and I'm a deep sleeper. And it was my father. He said, I'm being held hostage, and click. And the deep sleeper that I am, I went back to bed. Uh, about 8 o'clock, the radio went off, the clock radio, and it was Dateline, uh, Ithaca, or New York. It doesn't matter where it took place. But the uh, report was that students were holding the parents and employees hostage in the student union building at Cornell. You never saw anybody move so fast. I jumped out of bed, flew into my car, and took the 10-minute drive across campus to the student union building. By the time I got there, by the time I got there, and I broke every traffic rule in the book to get there, by the time I got to campus, he was outside on the south side of the student union building all by himself and its weed coat. I remember that picture uh, as if it were yesterday. He had been released. All the parents had been released. And it was a cold morning. It was, there's a term we use, ethicating. It was like a mist, a little snow in the air, a little rain, but it was a cold morning. And he was just cold. He wanted a cup of coffee. And he wanted to go back in to get that cup of coffee. And there was no way that was going to happen because by then the doors had been bolted. And the takeover of Willard Strait Hall, the student union building, had begun. Now, I know your three sons also went to Cornell. Yeah, we're, we're a Cornell family. What are their reactions of the stories that you tell them about your time at Cornell? They, they've had different reactions. Again, different eras they all went to, different ages. But when I tell them some of the stories in the book, they said, did that really happen? I said, yes, yeah, some of those things really happened. Times have changed, and those things wouldn't happen right now. It's a very different Cornell, as I said before. So another thing I learned about you when I was taking your class is that you do a lot of work with suicide prevention. Yes, Yes. Can you talk a little more about that? Yes, thank you for that opportunity. It's a passion of mine. I think my parents would have liked me to have been a medical doctor, but as I always say, I don't do well with blood, and I was a lousy science student. So the next best way to save lives was through suicide prevention. And it dates back to 1982, and again, a story with my father. He died suddenly in April, just about now, April 1982, and he would have given anything to live a few more years. He had a zest for life, but a sudden heart attack felled him. About the same time, there were some suicides in the greater metropolitan area, one of which, as I recall, was a student who went home for lunch, felt he was not the top of the class, but near the top, and took his own life. And I just couldn't fathom the fact that somebody would end it all with his whole future ahead of him. And I got very interested in suicide prevention when I tried to juxtapose, put those two thoughts together. And my district sent me to Boston to be trained in suicide prevention, not as a therapist, I must stress that I'm not a therapist, but as an educator who trains others what to look for, signs and symptoms, the referral process, etc., how to create a climate of caring. And since that time, I've been offering workshops as a volunteer, trying to create what I call a go-to person for everyone when the pressure cooker is about to explode. And you're tuned in to the Morning Wake Up Call on 88.7 FM WRHU. I'm Bradley Clark, and I'm talking with WCBS radio news reporter, Hofstra adjunct professor, and author, Dr. Stephen Cusin. Was Cornell a school that you always wanted to go to? And what was your dream job going into college? Yes, okay. Cornell was always the school that I wanted to go to. My parents met there, I believe, in 1939 during a summer program, and they vacationed there every summer. Kids go to camp. I went to Cornell campus, and it was beautiful spending July and August. They were school teachers and they took advantage of the rich cultural life which the uh, university offered during the summer. So it was my first choice in the college sweepstakes, and when I got that early decision letter, I jumped for joy. You could hear my, <laughs> my shouts of glee up in Ithaca, and it was definitely my choice, and my three sons followed suit. I didn't pressure them. 
they went on their own. I let them decide, but that's where they wanted to go. As a matter of fact, my third son started at University of Maryland, but his two brothers coaxed him into uh, joining them at, in the Cornell tradition. And I know now you're working on the screenplay version. I'd like, I'd like to get started. The surprising thing that's taken place that shocked me, I love to write and edit. I don't like sales, marketing, and merchandising. And I didn't realize how much of that there is. Fortunately, I have a terrific publicist, Deborah from Finn Partners, and she said, you don't like it, but that's my job, and she takes it from here. So as soon as I get done with some of the things I have to do, the obligatory things I have to do, I'd like to sit down because I picture the screenplay, I picture the movie. Any actors you think would be great for the five freshmen? Bradley, are you auditioning right now? I am auditioning right now. (laughs) Give me a cold read script, I'm ready to go. (laughs) Okay, okay. I, I get a lot of kidding about that. Somebody just emailed me a few seconds ago, it's funny you mentioned that, they said, you gotta have Richard Dreyfuss play your part. I said I was hoping for Ryan Reynolds or Tom Cruise, but he laughed when I told him that. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> and now Bradley Clark is at the top of the list. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> now I got to get a game show question in here because uh, we're, we're a game show fanatics. Yes. What was your favorite game show in the 60s? Favorite game show in the 60s? Very good question. It wasn't The Price is Right, which is now my favorite game show. Well, that time it was the Bill Cullen version. This is one you probably don't remember because it was uh, so short-lived. It was called Play Your Hunch. Play Your Hunch with Merv Griffin. You do remember that Of course. Oh, yeah. that was X, Y, and Z. Tell your listeners how that worked. It was just you had to have a hunch. It was almost like to tell the truth. Yeah, in a way. Right. One of these people fits this description. You can ask them some questions. What's your hunch? It's just a pure guess. Who fits the description? I, I always liked that show. I thought it was a clever show. Do you remember the show You Don't Say? I do remember with Tom Kennedy. Tom Kennedy, yeah. That was probably a, one of my favorite shows of the '60s. Yeah. Concentration with yeah, Hugh Downs. Con- I auditioned for Concentration. Did you really? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Concentration you was had my to do favorite. Rebus puzzles and Rebus I did puzzles, okay yeah. On them, but I never got the call. But you don't say it was a very interesting show. It was a different concept because the point of the show was you had to convey a name using sounds yeah. that sounded like the name to get your partner to say that name. So if I said, a mechanical man is known as a oh, okay. robot, uh, yeah. and then that could lead to the word Robert. Right. And it could be right, Robert right. Robert anything. Yeah, yeah. Robert Q. Lewis or any Robert. So that was the point of the game. And in case you just tuned in, I'm speaking with my in-studio guest, Dr. Stephen Cusin, author of a new novel called Five Freshmen, A Story of the 60s, about his time at Cornell University from 1965 to 1969. Any mentioning of 60s game shows in the novel? Yes. Really? Yes. Somewhat semi-autobiographical. I go back to 1950, I forget the year right now, and I go Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Now, do you know that one, Bradley? Minnesota Mining opening, at 3M. That was the no? opening for Tic-Tac-Toe, which was a, a Tic-Tac-Toe, Tic-Tac-Toe with Jack Toe. Barry. The, the original with Jack Barry. Original. And I begged my parents to take me to see the, uh, to go to Rockefeller Center to see a taping. As I recall back then, there was an age requirement. I, I might have been 12, I forget what it was. And as soon as I passed that age marker, I sent for tickets. I still remember seeing in the mailbox the NBC Peacock envelope with the tickets. And my father and I went to the city. He took me to the city and we were brought up in a huge freight elevator to the studio. The first thing that I noticed was how small the studio was. And everybody says that when they see a game show. What is a game board, two contestants and an MC take? Very small. The second was all the frenetic activity behind the game board, up above in the lights, the cables. And I said, this is what I wanted to get involved in television in some way. I wasn't so much interested in the game itself. I was, I was, but in all the things that went into making it happen. And of course, Tic Tac Toe later came back with Wink Martindale. Yeah, you. They brought that back. I can't stump you on any game show. I've discovered that. I have a pretty wide yeah. array of knowledge <laughs> in game shows. Yes, but you do. Well, that was one of the shows involved in the quiz, quiz show, show scandal, scandal was. along with 21 and Dotto. And, and you remember one of the defenses for the uh, game show scandal it was interesting if i'm not mistaken this was one of the defenses that was given when they were fixed so to speak to create excitement soap operas are drama why can't game shows be rehearsed and be drama too it didn't last very long, right. that defense, because people, so to speak, were duped. It was 21, I think 21, 21 with Charles other. Van Doren. Since those game show scandals, and there was a terrific movie, Quiz Show, right? Quiz Show, Quiz right, yeah. I urge the listeners to watch that. It's a great rainy Sunday afternoon movie. Standards and Practices now is very strict about what goes on. Now, you may recall, I told my class, my wife was on the third episode of the Nighttime Price is Right back in her early 1970s. With Dennis James. With Dennis James, episode three. And I was sitting there in the audience. I had never been seen the show on TV. And she was outbid by a book each time. So she never got to stay. It wasn't her fault. She was just outbid. So they came to the showcase. 
And they declared the winner, and I was tired a little bit. I said, I, I think they did the math wrong, but I guess I'm wrong. We start to exit, go up the aisles, and when Johnny Olson, who was the announcer then, remember Johnny Olson? Of course. Everybody, please take your seats. They had, in fact, announced the wrong showcase winner. So they said that they were going to reenact the showcase, and they told the audience, I remember this, to act just as wildly and applaud just as soundly as you did during the original. When we did that, my wife got her consolation prizes or signed off for them. She got... A World Book Dictionary, we still have that, and a year's supply of Orange Crush. We don't no have turtle that. wax? No, <laughs> no rice a no, no turtle wax, no rice a So every night, on Saturday night, that's when the syndicated version was on. We stayed home to watch, and it was never on. So finally, I wrote to NBC. It was then an NBC syndicated filler, and they said because of that so-called reenactment of the showcase, they decided never to show it. So her show was never aired. And I often wonder, all the prizes they gave away that day, the cars, they were never shown. So obviously the producers had a spring for it because they gave them away, but they couldn't give them away for free. It's such a shame that that one episode... Isn't that her one episode? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So at least we had stories to tell at parties. And I've gone back to see the show taped several times when I've been in Hollywood at Television City. And I always get a kick out of watching it done. It's so different seeing it in studio. Absolutely, yeah. And again, every time the audience walks in, you hear the same, it's so small, it's so small. It looks so big on television. TV expands the space. But really, it's three doors and an audience. It's not as big as it looks on television. Last question. I know you're a big Dancing with the Stars fan. Who's winning this season? I would say Simone, right? That's who I picked, Simone Biles. I picked originally, but I'm beginning to think there may be some surprises. I'm going to go with Simone right now. That's what I went with as well. Well, Dr. Cusin, it's always a thrill talking to you, and whether it be about game shows or your novel or all the other projects that you do wonderful work with. And I want to thank you so much for joining me on the program and talking about your book. Again, the title is Five Freshmen, A Story of the 60s. And I want to wish you all the success with the book. Thank you very much, Bradley, and thank you for having me. My pleasure. 